All right. We're live. Looks like we're live. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, folks may continue to trickle in as this uh, session, as this conversation today progresses. Um, but just so that we have the full hour for this, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so just to get started, by way of introductions, my name is Andrew Baskin, and I am a partner and worker owner at Lyft Economy. We'll share in a little bit more. We'll, we'll share in a little bit, um, a bit more about Lyft Economy. Um, but just to get started, um, these are my business partners, Kevin Bayuk and Ryan Honeyman, on the call. And uh, Ryan is going to briefly share some housekeeping details to kick us off. So Ryan, take it away. Thanks, Andrew. Um, hey, folks, I'm Ryan Honeyman, also from Lyft Economy. Uh, some quick housekeeping here. Um, so if you haven't used uh, Crowdcast before, um, you can submit questions. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says ask a question. So if you use that button, you can ask a question, and then you can either upvote um, questions that are posted. So we'd love to hear you know, we want to make this a two-way conversation. We'd love to hear what you're thinking, what you want to learn about. So um, maybe questions that you'd like to post to the group, uh, put that in and ask a question. Um, and if you have chats, like if you want to share resources or, you know, agree or disagree with certain things, like maybe the chat is better for that one. Uh, so resources and sort of reactions are best for chat and maybe questions that to hope for us to discuss or that we put to the group, just put in that, in that box. Um, and we'll do Q&A sort of like as we go through. This is going to be an iterative thing. Um, and if you're joining, I think we may have set up Facebook Live. So if you're listening to this on Facebook Live, you can also click the link uh, and join us here on Crowdcast where it's more interactive. Um, and a few quick broad strokes of the agenda. So we'll just do uh, the background and genesis for this series. Um, we'll do some framing around the next economy and some catalyzing questions um, that we hope will get into a two-way uh, conversation with you all. And just a quick note to say, you know, apologies if there's any technical issues. We're still getting to know Crowdcast, but we hopefully hope this will be a good experience. So, Andrew, I'll kick it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. So, yeah, so um, just to give a bit of uh, as Ryan indicated, a bit of introduction to the story and genesis um, behind this this series, um, and and kind of get it, give you a sense of of some of our thinking around um, why we're hosting these calls. What's the point? So, um, just to start by sharing about Lyft Economy, Lyft. Yeah, we call Lyft Economy Lyft for short often. But Lyft is uh, a worker-owned co-op with a mission to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life and to center um, the most marginalized folks in our work. And we've been doing Next Economy work for many years in various forms from um, consulting with many types of enterprises, mostly for profit, but also nonprofit and kind of entity agnostic. And um, we started uh, a few years back a an investment fund called the Force for Good Fund that invests in women and people of color owned social enterprises with outsized impact, uh, working towards systems change. And <clears throat> there's 13 investees in that fund and if folks are interested, we can share more about that. But to continue giving kind of an overview of Lyft, uh, we also do a number of online trainings like our Next Economy MBA. That's kind of our flagship online training program. We also have a podcast, which I produce. Some of you may um, tune into that. And uh, that's called Next Economy Now and and more. We have some field building initiatives, et cetera. But <clears throat> um, just to give... We, we, we throw around the word next economy um, pretty casually, but just to give a little bit of insight for those who may be new to the conversation, what um, we mean when we say that is um, sort of contrasting what we refer to as the business as usual economy, most of what we can see all around us um, that is largely just referred to as um, uh, capitalism. Um, 
that is kind of on a destructive path that is, you know, we, we all know <laughs> that it's, uh, it's, it's taking us on a degenerative path. So, you know, in the next economy, we want, we're, we're re referencing shifting from that more degenerative way of being in relationship to the more regenerative uh, reciprocal way uh, for mutual benefit way of being in relationship and how that um, plays out and manifesting in our businesses, in our economy and so forth. And we use the word next economy to kind of pay homage to the many indigenous cultures who have had thriving sustainable economies um, for millennia um, pre-conquest. So um, that gives a little bit of maybe color to how we're just thinking about the term next economy and um, there's many 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 actors in this broad ecosystem um, that we're all a part of in 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 this broader next economy movement and so that's <clears throat> um, that's maybe a, a soft touch on how we're thinking about it and Kevin will add more detail to that as uh, to that a little later as well um, but we're also really wanting to create some shared language here. Um, so we'd love to hear like what comes up for you. Feel free to drop into the chat when I'm, you know, next economy for me means this, or I prefer this language or, or what have you. So we really want to just um, really make sure that all of you know that this is a two way conversation. Um, so in terms of this series, this hashtag next economy movement series, we wanted to um, the genesis of it is that we wanted to do an online summit to bring folks together um, as online summits do, but we realized that in order to really serve the movement, um, in, in order to really serve folks best, we really needed to sort of depart from the conventional online summit format um, that just sort of kind of like pushes out content um, from on high. And that's fine. Um, that, that definitely serves its role and purpose. But we felt like we needed another piece uh, to add to this. Um, you know, online gathering um, setting where, um, where we can actually involve everyone in the formation of this thing from the very beginning and have it we take kind of more of like a, an emergent strategy type of organizing approach. So we started putting feelers, <clears throat> excuse me, we started putting feelers out through our newsletter and, and through our Facebook page and kind of put together a survey. And some of you, um, many of you offered incredible invaluable feedback that we've been, that has really informed our thinking so far. And that has really informed moving from, as we were thinking about doing this big kind of next economy uh, online summit to these sort of smaller conversations where we can um, that, that happen consistently that we can uh, engage and kind of taking an evidence based approach from some of the information that we got from the survey. Um, when we sent out the survey, we heard that this um, type of series of smaller conversations uh, would be really helpful. Um, so recognizing that this process that we're in is emergent and that um, at least in how we're thinking about it, part of our role is to help kind of facilitate this emergence rather than planning some larger event in the future, um, thinking about what we can take action on now and catalyzing these conversations and participation to help organically inform and build towards something larger that's in service to our next economy movement. And it's something that we've been thinking about pre-COVID, but the COVID crisis definitely makes this work uh, in organizing our collective voice and aggregating that together to, um, you know, organize our collective brain trust. Um, it makes that all the more urgent. And uh, just to kind of bring in a level of transparency, like we're not, Lift economy has a lot of experts and we're not experts and our intention is not to to take that position in this conversation. Our intention is to not make this really at all about us, um, but to make it about all of us. And we want to just kind of be transparent and vulnerable that we're um, we're learning 
um, how to engage in this process and uh, learning new tools to try and um, really help uh, make the form follow the function and, and fit our sort of shared purposes. So I'm gonna just be you know, vulnerable that we're learning and might not get this thing right, right off the bat, but hopefully we can all be somewhat patient with the emergent process and support carrying this conversation to a place that really serves uh, the movement. Um, and just another last piece to that is we're, we're also just holding some, some tension or some questions around how to best facilitate this emergence and are really open and would love um, like suggestions from all of you. We love Crowdcast and it's a tool that we'll probably continue using in at least in our immediate future sessions. Um, and uh, we'd also really love your suggestions. I'm sure there's a lot of wisdom in the crowd about tools and technology that can kind of support like frictionless, asynchronous participation so that you're not just hearing our voices the whole time. And so that, um, yeah, you can engage when and where it's best for you. So hopefully that kind of frames up a little bit um, the, the genesis of how we arrived to this moment. And this first session is really intended to catalyze this broader conversation. Um, so with that, I'll maybe hand it over to Kevin to kind of like share, dive a little bit more into, you know, what is the next economy and how we're catalyzing this conversation. Great, Andrew, thank you. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the important ideas around what is the next economy is it's not for me to say, or even for Lyft to say, um, we don't take the position that we know and somebody else doesn't. Um, but we do see that there is the potential for an economy that authentically works for the benefit of all life with nobody left out, where every human has their needs being met, food, water, shelter, loving relationships, the things that we really need to thrive as humans in ways that actually repair and regenerate the environment and society around us and within which we live. So what, what would you call that? And we've, we sometimes use the term, the next economy as a way to describe that. And we do see it happening. It's emergent, but largely disconnected. It's like the, what do I mean by that? I'm gonna give an example of what I would, if I were to use a, a term like a next economy organization, I'm just gonna to refer to this or, uh, farm, uh, one of the investees in the Force for Good Fund that Andrew mentioned is called Our Table. Our table is a multi-stakeholder cooperative farm in Sherwood, Oregon. On the one hand, it's a 65-acre farm, you know, with great farming practices, great food, um, but it's different. It's fundamentally different from probably any farm you've ever visited or interacted with in that one, it's partially owned by the workers. And if you know about worker exploitation and agriculture and food, this is a really big and distinct thing. There's probably less than 20 worker owned farms in this country and the United States for those of you who are joining internationally. Um, but it's not just owned by the workers, uh, mostly Latinx workers, it's also owned by a network of producers in the Willamette, in its region. Uh, so there's some producers who produce it, other growers who grow lentils and, and, and wheat berries and you know, grapes for wine and, and other goods that, the, that the, this particular farm on the 65 acres does not grow. But then there's a third class of owners, which is the consumers in the region who also participate in buying the food and it's also micro, micro vertically integrated, but I don't want to go into the details there. But this, this ownership structure and the way it operates is distinct in that it's able to produce really high quality nutrition um, in a way that supports community resilience and community wealth building and making that nutrition more accessible. The consumers, the producers and the workers actually get together and decide how much should the food cost? How much should the workers be paid? And this is a collaborative, democratic way of providing for the community's needs in a fundamentally different way. Now, our table as an example of a next economy organization by itself is one thing, but imagine in your mind's eye for a moment, what if every region in this country or the world had a, a, a set of uh, our tables or a mosaic of our tables? What would that mean for the food system? What would that mean for local self-reliance and resilience? 
especially in times of catastrophe and crisis. Um, but not just food, what if it was all sorts of goods and services that humans need to thrive? And what we've realized at Lyft Economy is that no amount of working with individual cooperatives or even federated groups of communitarian organizations or nonprofits and commons initiatives and all their novel structures and operating um, democratic processes will be adequate, will be enough or fast enough or large enough to achieve the whole systems and societal level changes that are required to see that economy that works for the benefit of all life. And it brings up these big questions. What are the barriers to making that economy present and not so fractured, but like self-evident and everywhere for all time. And there are significant barriers, cultural barriers, and they keep me up at night. They're cultural barriers and systemic barriers, and I wanna name them and then posit that I think a movement is the only thing that my mind gravitates toward is what's needed. So like all these voluntary efforts of collectives and open hiring organizations and land trusts, they're very great and we wanna support them. But how do those, how do we make those normal and successful and the the norm of the economy without simultaneously addressing mass incarceration, uh, privatization, the militarization of law enforcement, environmental racism, housing discrimination. Um, and then there's big cultural things too, like how do we organize enough mass to transform the media landscape and the education landscape? or the enormity of state and nation state funds that go to military or fossil fuel subsidy or policing and incarceration. How do we redirect those to reparations and community wealth building and long-term strategies around education and restorative justice and just transition employment programs that don't just create jobs or livelihoods, but actually wealth in communities that have been not only left behind, but directly oppressed. Um, how do we have a regenerative infrastructure, healthy land, healthy water, um, you know, and how do we move away from the brutality of the lack of an equitable universal health care type of system, which we see COVID bringing to bear? And then how do we change the big thing, like also big things like to a community led government governance and participatory budgeting and reshaping trade agreements. So like bioregional self-resilience and reliance could be more normal. Um, and I think some of these moments, uh, and there's even bigger things too. I just big, big, big things like retrofitting the monetary system, shifting from GDP to alternative measures of success for the economy. We draw a lot of inspiration from solidarity economy organizations like Symbiosis Revolution, Movement Generation, Cooperation Jackson, of course, a new economy coalition, Common Future, Rising Majority. And we're just, I'm, this is me, not we, we, I feel stuck on how to draw the connections of the massive plurality of grassroots movements that exist to kind of effectuate the cultural and systemic transformations. And I'm, I'm, I, I'll, I'll confess I'm at a loss. I need your all help as to like, how do we do this? How do we connect and build power? Yeah, I think that's, it's a great question, and maybe we could even pose that to the to the group. You know, one of the things that we were thinking about in relation to this, and if folks want to put it in the chat or ask a question, we do have some questions that we'll get to. Thanks to Eric and Isabel for pre pre posting some questions. This is awesome. Um, and you know, maybe a first question to just maybe frame some of y'all discussion um, is. What is the role of movements? You know, we called this an ex economy movement series. Um, it seems like the terminology around movements uh, is, is increasingly important. Um, you know, movement for black lives, climate change movements. We have a lot of movements and I'm not sure if the term existed that much, maybe 10 years ago, but um, it seems like the only thing that we can do now to address larger systemic patterns is to, is to sort of, um, bring our movements together. Um, so maybe, uh, Andrew, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? And you know, maybe I'll post it also, or folks have thoughts, but just like around how movements are, are important and you know, what might be different going forward. Like what should, what, what should we, we be thinking about in terms of that? Yeah, and again, you know, I, like part of, I wanna just share like, 
we I don't have the answers. We have the answers together to these to these questions. And I, I can share a thought um, on that. And I like we there's many building off of what Ryan just shared around kind of uh, building bridges across movements and, and having a movement of movements and, and creating the space for the, that conversation to happen. Um, I think that we're in um, an ongoing new era <laughs> of, uh, you know, technologies and um, opportunities that um, can help help support that organizing in a new way. Um, and that part of that is like in the format, a lot of movements in the past have been really centralized, say, on on a, a charismatic leader on 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 um, an individual or a small group of folks that are kind of at the center piece of it and um, i think um, from a strategic van vantage point as well as just building in more resilience and and collective brain trust trying to um, explore how we can how we can build this conversation in a way that is um, you know have have movement building and a conversation space that is decentralized where we can engage and participate in a way that works for us and um, make these uh, intersections between pockets of conversations that are traditionally siloed um, and to uh, try and, and, and support our movement in, in being more coordinated. Um, there's a framework called the four R's model that's like resist, reform, recreate and reimagine. Um, um, I'm, I'm spacing on, on who to give credit to for that, um, but it's not our framework. I'll just, I'm referencing it for, for this moment um, where those are, those are all different parts um, of the movement. There's the resistance work and kind of stopping the, the harm that's happening in the immediate term. There's the um, uh, reforming kind of some of the existing powerful systems that are maybe like structured to not work for us that disincentivize or legally uh, mandate behavior that's not values aligned um, and working to reform those systems. We have the, you know, reimagining what we're actually trying to move towards and build. And then there's like the recreating. Um, and those things are all, sometimes there, there's overlaps there, but how can we create the space and kind of collectively think together um, in service to, um, you know, creating a collective vision that we're all a North Star, that we're all sort of from all of our, the wealth that each of us brings from our particular vantage points that we can help to orient in, in um, funneling ourselves to work. And I mentioned the COVID crisis uh, at the beginning of the call. It's like in the moment that we're in right now um, with, uh, with with so much you know, you know systems vulnerability there's opportunities that will be taken up um, by people from across the values spectrum and um, I think for those who are in the values aligned place that want to see this economy that works for the benefit of all life it's a really important time to begin to bridge some of these conversations and we're not necessarily wanting we're, I don't want to say necessarily we're not wanting this place to be just a space for a sort of armchair conversation, but how can we have conversation that moves, that moves towards power, uh, building collective power? So maybe I'll, I'll hand it back to uh, <laughs> hand it back to you, Kevin, to kind of pick it up from there. You know, one thing, one thing, then Kevin, maybe you could speak on this. There's some great comments around, um, <clears throat> you know, Eric, I like the distinction between movements and institutions, movements shouldn't be hindered by pragmatism. They need to change consciousness towards a more honest and integrated path. And institutions can have those values, but also need to get things done. Um, and that resonated, it reminded me of a, a conversation with um, Naomi Klein, where she was talking about all of the, you know, you have climate justice folks, racial justice folks, indigenous rights, unions, all these different large groups um, who have come together on some issues in the past, but uh, 
it was often around like blocking something like we don't want this pipeline or like we don't want this thing to happen and she did something where she got i think 70 different movement leaders together and we're like why have we not collectively decided what we want actually like what do we actually want to build instead of like what do we not want um and she spoke about that was the um genesis behind her leap manifesto for any of you who follow um i can put it in the chat after but around um it's also like we're not going to wait for a petition to come to us to tell us like we're not going to say like oh that's the person i want to support we have to create our own platforms and movements and say if you want us to vote for you you need to sign on to our platform like we need to sort of create more of a positive approach like what is the actual platform we want to hold and then have people say that that's something that they want to do too as opposed to like waiting for some amazing politician to come save us all um i'm curious kevin did, what, what are your thoughts on that and also you know happy if you pick up any threads and they're coming up in the chat for you personally I, i'd be curious to in the spirit of how andrew framed this whole conversation is to bring in other voices i'm wondering if somebody maybe isabel or paul there's so many great and eric there's so many great comments coming in i'm wondering if we yeah. could bring in other voices is that possible sure Does somebody eric's down can, can i'm we... gonna invite eric up on screen here to test some crowdcast functionality um if me. you need to drop me you can drop me to bring hey, is eric? Can, you, there he is. can you hear me yep yeah. Um, oh yeah, I'll just kind of double down on that point. I was listening to the Ezra Klein podcast and it was an episode about how after Bernie Sanders lost, how progressives can still win. And it was kind of like a sad defeat, but there was just like a long conversation about the idealism of the Bernie Sanders campaign, which tried to function as a movement um, and how like actual practical steps could have led to a better outcome that might have required more compromise in the pragmatism that we talked about. Um, but like, obviously he did a lot of work in shifting the conversation around, you know, healthcare, energy, which is great. Um, but if we don't have that clear line where we try to put movements in spaces where movements aren't supposed to be just yet, um, it was just like a wake up call to me um, of, I think there's a pure and pragmatism scale where it's like, you'd be too pure. You can never get anything done. If you're too pragmatic, you'll burn the earth. <laughs> um, so trying to find the balance and the different ways that we can organize um, to kind of make that happen. But Thank you. I love it. Um, Andrew, Kevin, any, any thoughts? Or? Uh, I think I wanted to just reflect uh, one thing I heard from Eric that just really resonates with uh, a framework that we sometimes use and not to just throw around frameworks and models and get into abstraction, but uh, the Burkana Institute uh, has developed this two loops model um, where simultaneously when there's harm reduction and pragmatic incrementalism work being done to reduce harm and, and make the existing system less bad and less uh, harmful in its impacts there's needs to be a simultaneity of a space to actually from new axioms new foundational structures and just the the if not new uh, like andrew mentioned hark reckoning back from the lived experience of indigenous peoples and and communities that are already working in solidarity being courageous enough to have this uh this other loop or this other trajectory and that those two things work in simultaneity. And one thing that I wonder is, like, I, I, I know some people are doing a lot of the harm reduction work, but they don't see the other piece. And then I do see some people working on the other piece, which is the more pure or the visionary, w taking a stance of what we really want, who then uh, will begin to hate on the incrementalist pragmatism uh, because it's obviously wholly inadequate. And so there becomes the schism within like the movement fractures just in a hard line right there of like doing the work that's obviously wholly inadequate but important to reduce harm now what's pragmatic now is not going to be the thing that we need to do um, in the long run and so how do we hold both 
um, this this both andness that I, I, I get stuck on how to communicate that or share that. I know maybe a number of us on this uh, conversation maybe hold both, but I, I don't know how to do it or how to communicate that well. Cool. Eric, any other thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was a good point, Kevin. Um, and I think that there is a uh, similar to the questions I asked, that in moments of crisis, it's going to accelerate a lot of these conversations uh, where, you know, I'm in community organizing work and I was going to have a year ahead of me of trying to explain to people why equity is important. And now I don't have to explain that anymore. Um, but I think the places where we disagree in those two polls, um, these are the places where people, people come together or those fissures show even more. Um, and I think that's the hard part about the coalition building uh, is finding the right people. Like I'm going over to my friend's house later today, social distance, but to like see if we can align before we do some community work. Um, but that takes like building long-term relationships and making sure we're saying the right words. Um, and I don't know, we don't have our scarlet letters or our badges that say like, yep, I agree with the 45 things that you agree with and we differ in this way and it's okay. Um, if those platforms exist that can like enable federation to become easier, um, I don't know, it can shorten those conversations of switching the goals from, it's not about who gets the most credit, which we've heard before. Like we wanna do community work, but can you put our face on the flyer uh, and switch it to more outcomes focused? So um, yeah, I don't know. I think I am in a mindset where I'm just gonna try to collaborate as many people as possible, no matter what, uh, and just try to be integrated. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We don't have a chance to like have a kind of clean, uh, come together in this. It's going to have to be messy and like accept a mess. So, but thank you guys for letting definitely, me hop on. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before you dropped, I'm just curious, you're, well, can we bring him back on real quick? I'm just, he, yeah. He's uh, based in Compton. And I'm just, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd love to bring him back on real quick. Um, yep. Just maybe Let me bring you back a little bit more about like, yeah, what, what you're working on and, and, um, I think you mentioned that you're based in Compton, so I just wanted to get like a, a place-based sense of, um, yeah, what's what's going on. Yeah, so in this work, it's kind of two fronts. Right now, I'm building a um, COVID kind of text hotline. So specifically in the Black community, there's a lot of kind of misinformation, specifically on when this will end, will things go back to normal. Uh, so just like I'm, I'm, I just quit my job in the tech industry last year, so I'm like I can build these things pretty quickly. Uh, and it's, yeah, just providing resources uh, kind of on the like survival front, meet people's physical needs first before you ask them to like go to every town hall meeting. Uh, and so that's one side and the other side is just like, I just moved back home and I'm just trying to canvas my neighborhood with a different perspective and the different things that I've learned from your podcasts and these different books of who owns the land, how clean is our water, you know, who owns this business just kind of going through the city and doing a new type of canvas with a different mindset. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Well, let me bring up uh, Isabel here. She's, um, uh, I think Mexican Isabel's calling in from Massachusetts. Okay. Let's see some good Keeps in here, Jed. Thanks for Dr. Wild. Kind of genius, his ability to simultaneously hold two opposite ideas in mind. Hey, Isabel. Hi. How's it going? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um. Yeah. This is great. Thanks yeah. for having this. Um. Ideal world. We need like lift economy. We need sunrise movement. We need the reform alliance. We need all of these kind of like. Yes, the Sunrise does environment and you guys are working on total economic system change. And then we have the Reform Alliance that's working on um, prison reform. This all in the same, it's like, it, could we get a group, could we reach out and get all of these different groups, the leaders of each of these groups with Naomi Klein, with like, um, yeah, any, all of these kind of people with clout, people that have prestige, people that are known, that are advocating for some kind of change because we can't work in silos. We also really need finance. And so I actually am glad that Lyft Economy has this own um, investment fund because I think if we shifted 
everything about the current economy, but we didn't shift finance, then we didn't really do much, right? Finance is the bottom line uh, as in this current economy. Um, so how do we, how do we sh kind of slowly um, turn the dial um, while having, I guess, a common understanding of the kind of economy that we're looking? So we want one that respects the environment. We want them one that respects human life. We want one that's just. We want the one that's inclusive. We want them one that like respects um, the wisdom of the indigenous population, like all these things. So we can't necessarily work in silos in my hope or vision or idea of how to build power would be to get build a base of solidarity between the groups and community like people in the movement that have power and that will advocate for this kind of thing and i think what we are missing is the clear vision of what we're looking for like are we looking for degrowth is that something that we're advocating for? What does a degrowth economy look like? How do you build, how do you get investors to invest in something if you're not really investing for growth? What's their return gonna look like? Like, it's extremely complex. Um, but that's not to say it's impossible. Um, but we I think we have to like get um get the clout and these larger movements that are already developed, Black Lives Matter, like get everybody to work together would be my, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and maybe Kevin or Andrew, any any thoughts on sort of examples of that in motion that you want to bring forward or thoughts for, for Isabel? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I really love what everything that, that you're sharing, Isabel, and, and definitely am in alignment with that. I think where my mind is going is um, is in part kind of like to the to the how piece um, um, of like, how, how do we how do we do that is and like what 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 tools can we use to maybe bring a space where people can engage in whatever comp like whatever level um, and, and scope of conversation that they feel inspired to um, um, that they have expertise in or that they have an interest in or what have you. And also like at the level of how many people need to engage in that conversation, whether it be, you know, people who are leading folks um, or it be folks who are, um, you know, being quote unquote led or that are participating through, um, you know, community to an aggregated um, um, emergent leadership model like how do we <clears throat> does is that like you know I, I i love like in this platform right we can ask a question in the chat box for example and people can upvote it and downvote it so we can kind of quickly get a sense of like in aggregate this is what you know granted you know we only have say maybe 30 people on this call so in terms of statistics like that number might be not be super meaningful. It's great for this conversation, but like at a larger scale, how can we do that? Where it's like things, we have systems that bubble up to the top that that um, allow for that broad based participation. But so if that if that's yeah, really we need it, consensus. It we need consensus, and it needs to be sort of simplified consensus. Like we're not going to get everybody to agree on everything, but if we can get some people to agree on like basic story, basic narrative, basic representation of what we think the new or next or lift or green or blue or circular economy, like all these economies, right? Like there are these movements exist and they're very similar to each other. And I think in the US particularly, like we struggle with chewing, the left chews each other out to a point where it's like, we're kind of ineffective as a, um, a political like grouping. Um, and so we need, um, in, in, in my opinion, like very simple 
terms to which we can agree upon. And then it may be you can start building power by saying, hey, we're lift economy and we think we believe that we need a different economy that represents the people that live in it, that, you know, supports the environment, that does these different things like five small um, statements. And then you say, hey, Sunrise Movement, what do you think about this? Do you agree? Okay, hey, Black Lives Matter, what do you think about this? Do you agree? And then all of a sudden you have a document that lays out a vision, kind of, a, a basic vision for a new economy or a next economy. And then you have all these people that are saying, yes, 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 yes. And then maybe that seeds some, I'm making this up. So <laughs> this is like not a well thought out idea, um, but I'm just uh, um, trying to, to like, in, I think in order to, so many thoughts. Um, I think in order to see power, you need power sometimes, um, whether that be like power of population or power of people that are representing whatever it is that you're trying to develop. Um, it also needs to be simple. And um, I would think that, sorry, I'm reading the comments at the same time, so I'm losing my train of thought, but um. Yeah, uh, I'm losing my train of thought, but I think uh, we could we could seed power by building um, kind of a baseline of what we're looking for. And I think also one thing that I have been thinking about recently that we're really missing is what this looks like. Like we're very quick to be like capitalism. It's so wrong. It's so bad. It does all these things. Well, what about if you close your eyes and think about what the world's going to look like in 2035, what do you open your eyes and what do you see? And then how, how do you build that vision so that we're saying, Hey, people buy into this vision that we have because that feels like very, it feels like that's a huge piece that's missing. Yeah. And let me, um, Paul, we had some other folks I'm going to bring up to kind of continue the, yeah, go ahead. the voices. Thanks as well. Yeah, thanks. Awesome to have you. Uh, so let's see here. Let me bring up Paul. And um, yeah, because one of his questions was around um, what are the various ways forward that you all see disparate initiatives can come together? Um, so I'd love to, hey, Paul. Hi, everybody. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Um, yeah. I, you... I, love, I love the discussion. Thank you for your, sharing your points, um, Isabel. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, like if there are, I just keep having this metaphor of like all of these widgets or apps or gears turning in these local region regional areas and just like figuring out strategic ways for them to overlap. You know, like what what is the software that you need, the code that you need, or the like mechanical engineering that you need to align these movements. And it doesn't have to be permanent. It could be strategically for like initiatives or for specific pushes. And I know, like for instance, I know that um, the force for the common or force for good fund like you all have aligned with other with several other funds to really like promote your vision for the entrepreneurship that you want to invest in. Um, but I'm just curious, like how how do we like dogpile? You know, or <laughs> that's like a crude metaphor, but you know, like how do are there like discrete areas that we see like for overlap so that people who are normally working on direct service models or like harm reduction models or policy advocacy lobbying can like strategically participate. Kevin, do you, I, oh, Andrew, go for it. Just to jump in, yeah, I mean, I, I love that those questions and I think that like that's part of, that's a like a large reason, I think why those questions you just articulated is a large reason why we wanna hold this space to I think kind of grow the space and the opportunity for um, for that to emerge. But I think like a lot of times it's, there's like, the, there's two ways to approach something is like identify the, you know, point B and then try and close the gap from point A to point B. And, and part of that like, if we say point B is is that 
dogpiling, right? That that coming together, the, the bridging of those conversations, the de-siloing, how do we get from there here to there? There's that kind of forward thinking process. And then there's the approach that's like this emergent process kind of that we're in of like, how can we create spaces for that to, for that to emerge? Um, and that like, so I'm, I'm in alignment basically with, with the questions that you're articulating, right? Uh, Ryan or Kevin, I think Kevin, you're about to share some thoughts. Um, it, it's, it's thoughts that it, that it's almost like, um, questions that I hold, for example, like when we take a historical view, I believe, or at least one historical lens is that organizing labor has been played that role of different cogs. And then they, when they come together, um, and using the power of the strike and boycott have been actually the major levers for a lot of systemic shifts and sometimes cultural shifts. And then those get institutionalized in parties and then the parties get corrupted by the business as usual economy and the kind of like historical pattern. Um, and with automation and the fracturing of labor, um, is that even possible in the future? Do we, can we rely on those same patterns? What are the organizing, what are the cogs, you know? Um, and I do, do, I do acknowledge there are lots of local initiatives and um, how we then um, come to some kind of democratic alignment. Um, I feel like I agree with Andrew, like I, I don't, I see some glimmers of hope that I, an inspiration, but it's, part of one of the motivations for this kind of conversation, this ongoing conversation is exactly that. So I think Paul, you're, you're touching on like something that's really important. How do we get things going in the same direction when there's already a tremendous number of existing efforts in this plurality of grassroots initiatives? Um, and uh, yeah, I wish I had answers. I, it, but one of the questions that's coming up, it came up in the chat and it, based on um, the Isabella shared and then Jed comments as well. I wonder about this tension, and again, I'm asking this because I don't know, but I'll just want to share my thoughts. I've had this tension between, do we need to make the case for change um, or double down on the vision for what we have, what we want in common, um, or both, right? Or maybe, or is there an order of operations there? And you know, it's like sickening to me, literally, like on a visceral level to think that we would still need to make the case for change if the tremendous harm on black and brown bodies, the tremendous destruction of the environment, the fact that there's 800 million people will be hungry tomorrow, today, and yesterday. Um, where I mean, we could draw so many lines or data points that we still need to make the case that it's broken um, is like sickening to me, but I wonder if it's true. Um, it, like, I wonder if we still need to make that case or how we make that case so that um, what I feel this really is something that everybody feels um, or that more people feel, I don't know. And then on the collective visioning, like, do we need the, these, again, I'm stuck. Do we need the, the collective case for change in order to go to the collective visioning of what it looks like? Or can we bypass the case for change, go straight to collective visioning? And then, uh, I think Isabel was sharing some of these things. I don't know how simple or complex, I don't know how to, I mean, there's science fiction about the vision for it. And then I, but what I think that I see happening is I see uh, resilience and models existent in indigenous communities and uh, other solidarity economy. That, that's some of our work at Lift Economy is trying to uplift the stories. And I think our podcast is an attempt to be one of those repositories of the vision, but I don't know how to get to an aligned vision. It's again, so the democratic process this uh, consensual thing is where I get hung up on. And um, I, I'm definitely appealing to y'all in the collective wisdom here to, to figure this out. I think there's also thought an thought. element, yeah. yeah, just with vision, I feel like there's an element and a need for true innovation, not just in our like, policies or things like that, but also in like the way we run businesses and the way we develop industries. Like I, I resonate with so much of what people say. And then I think of my family that grew up or that's still in Southeast New Mexico, which is like a rural oil driven economy. And like, there is no picture you could paint that would really be able to transition a 30,000 person community or 60,000 person community 
to a non-oil economy. Like I don't, they, there's no vision you could say. The only material change that would happen would have to be an industry, like a huge investment of, like in transformation of industry. And I don't know, it's like, when I think of like, I don't know, it's like, I don't know how to get that group of people who historically might've been aligned at least somewhat in the labor movement. Um, I don't know how to get them on board the more urban case for, you know, democratic ownership or, you know, all these different things that seem pretty obvious or desirable to our groups. It's tough. They just awesome. don't even before, get a before. livelihood, <laughs> you know, a livelihood that's possible that isn't extracted. Totally. That's super common. And just before we, I think we might um, <clears throat> shift over to Jed, but before we um, take you off the screen, just want to curious where you're based and, and, and kind of what you're working on a little bit, Paul. Sure. I'm based in Denver, Colorado. Um, I have, I, I live, I'm developing a limited equity housing co-op here. And then we also um, have a, an investment club that's a grassroots investment club. So people basically contribute 20 to 200 bucks a month. And then we pull in and try to invest in co-ops and community land trusts and things like that. So. Love it. Awesome. Um, great. Well, let me shift over to Jed here. Um, so we've got about, uh, let's see, about nine minutes left. Um, Jed's question for folks is, is this really an either or question or simply one of linking concurrent efforts at multiple levels and parts of our system? Yeah, mm -hmm. strongly, yeah, excited to hear what Jed has to say on that front. And um, while we're pulling him up, um, I wanted to share this quote from uh, Gopal Dianeni of Movement Generation that I think ties into this is really, really well that we're holding is that urgency should not enable desperation because desperation enables false solutions. And so like, oftentimes we can kind of get in the frenetic of like, we got to take action and how and, and, and all of that. And um, just breathing in some like um, awareness around. I really love that quote. I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. Where are we at with our... So Jed says accepted and connecting. Um, okay. He may have the same uh, tech, tech. It's not letting me on some kind of compatibility issue. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, um, uh, let's see, Andrew, do you want to speak to that idea of um, is it either or, or are they concur concurrent efforts at multiple levels and parts of the system? Well, yeah, I think, I think, I think building off of, and, you know, I, I want to hold space um, to maybe pick up on, let, let Jed pick up on the thread in his own words. Um, but my, where that takes my mind is that, like, there's already so much going on right? Already so much incredible, great work all over the country, all over the world. I'm, when I say the country, I'm in the US. So, um, but all over the world, you know, the next economy movement is in motion. That's part of the name of, of, of our podcast, Next Economy Now. It exists. It's just culturally invisible to most of us. Um, and, and it's also a lot of it is siloed. And a lot of times people are head down in operations, um, you know, doing pioneering work. And so what is the role for trying to link, to build uh, uh, like flows, feedback loop, communication between these various parts um, and, and continue to build a, a strong base of collective um, participation and, and, and visioning together so that it's like real power. I think earlier in the conversation, there was the level of kind of like the upper level politics kind of level of the conversation um you know presidential candidates and, and that kind of like tier up there and i think one thing that is always just really empowering for me is to think like what what can we do what can i do with my own two hands what can we do with our own two like it's enough to fill in a little bubble on a thing and and, and maybe advocate for a person over there but in the whole rest of the 99.9 percent .9 of my time what can i we do together 
to lift up. And I think that's where, that's where, that's where this lives on the podcast, for example, over and over again, um, leaders are, are saying that, oh, I would really love to connect with so-and-so on this. You know, I really love to connect so-and-so on this. And so kind of hearing these calls, I think, you know, we're, we're trying to look to the question of how, um, and it's definitely, in, in more cases, it's, it, it, it seems like it's a more of a both and than an either or. In some cases, that may be, the, it, may, it may be an either or question. Um, but in a lot of cases, it's a both and. And largely, I think this conversation um, is around linking efforts and, and aggregating our input and having a way to like um, move through disagreement in order to like move towards that, you know, shared this, this, that Gail keeps kind of, and, and others in the chat keep bringing up this, this, how do we, how do we have a process and a space for ourselves to continuously move towards like shared vision? And, and I forget who forgot who mentioned it um, in the chat, but it's, it's also articulating what we're saying no to, you know, in the business is usually economy. That's a part of it too, what we're saying no to and what we're saying yes to. So that's kind of what, what comes up for me in, in reading Jed's comment. But, Conscious, we're uh, a few minutes out, so I'll maybe pass yeah. it back to you too. Yes. Um, so maybe in the last couple minutes, I just wanted to note that there was a comment, um, a great comment, Charlotte, a question about, um, I feel like what we're describing is the Bernie campaign and like what ways are people thinking about not losing energy? Um, you know, I think that that's a great point and sort of, um, you know, the, the, the resource I posted in the, in the chat there is around, um, discussing race and class together. Cause I think a lot of folks, at least on the left are sometimes like, do we talk about race or do we like the white swing voter and stuff like that? And the, it's a really, really interesting video. Ian Haney Lopez wrote a book too called merge left. And it's about like, how do you like merge all of these desperate movements? Uh, so it can be like a super majority and like hold better uh, winning capabilities in the future that like meets the needs of people of color and, you know, working class folk, white working class folks, people, POC working class. Um, so just a, a shout to say that's um, uh, a reference. Um, and also some um, logistics. So we're planning on hosting. So Andrew had mentioned in the very beginning that we were planning on doing like one sort of like you've seen all these online summits, like a five day, like 30 speakers, you know, we still may do that, but a lot of the feedback that we got from folks was, you know, sometimes those are two one way, it's like a pre-recorded one way conversation, like sort of like teaching at the audience um, and there's no like communication and, and collaboration. So one of the things we wanna do with this is to have a more frequent um, collaborative discussion where it's two way and we can sort of think about building this movement. Uh, and so we've got, just to mention, we've got two other dates coming up for our second session of these. Um, on Tuesday, May 26th um, at noon Pacific, and then June 16th, uh, 2020 at, at noon. Um, so that's session two and session three. We haven't decided 100% what we're going to talk about yet, because part of this whole thing was you know, we want this to be emergent. This is part of emergence. But we think like every three weeks, three to four weeks um, is sort of like enough space to not be like annoyingly too many of these <laughs> in a row um, and also too hard of, on us to like produce, but also gives us enough frequency that we can have um, uh, sort of a building set of dialogue uh, and action. So just, um, yeah, I really wanted to appreciate you all for joining. Um, this was amazing. It was a great first run. Um, this will be. This is recorded. It'll be posted to our YouTube. Um, you can ask us at the same link. This is yeah. the same link as the is the replay. And Ryan and Andrew, if I have your permission, I just want to elevate something that Eric put in the chat that I think is really yeah. important. To, you know, uh, as frontline communities, not just with climate change and other things, but the COVID crisis is impacting different communities differently. And at this moment, uh, uh, I'm making sure that we elevate for everybody's attention to fo focus on mutual aid and support. And if anybody on this call, I certainly hope your you and your loved ones are well and cared for at this moment. In in, in the case where 
that, that your communities are not, please do reach out to Lift Economy. I'm not saying there's anything we can do or, or even say, but we are trying to connect mutual aid networks that we know of and are aware of, and we're trying to directly support them in ways we know how. Um, so anything about this particular moment, keeping people alive, keeping people housed, um, you know, we know there's likely to be lots of, uh, we know there's suffering happening and there's likely to be a lot of long tail suffering that could emerge. And uh, there's a, 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 um, there is an urgent attention there. I think that's, uh, I just wanted to elevate. Thanks Eric for uh, bringing it up. Great. Thanks, for, thanks, thanks for everyone. And we'll be in touch um, via email, um, but uh, we thank you all. And um, let's keep this conversation going. Have a great rest of your week. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.